Welcome to Health Beat Live. My name is Tyler and I am reporting for the for Healthy Newsworks from East Narden, Pennsylvania. On this video call with me is Dr. Risa Lavizo Moray. She is a professor of health equity and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania and the former CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. She also was a 2012 Healthy Newsworks health leader. Dr. Lavizo Moray, thank you for taking your time to talk to me today. It's my pleasure. Nice to meet you. My first question is, the coronavirus is having a big impact on communities and the people who live in them. When do you think our lives will go back to normal? Well, I, I don't think people are going to like this answer, but my sense is it's going to, we won't really get back to normal until we have a vaccine or an effective treatment so that the things that have changed in our environment can, we know that we can correct them easily. And depending on who you talk to, the estimates of when we're going to have a vaccine range from 12 months to 18 months. I've heard some promising things lately that it could be less than that, but realistically, it's going to take that long to develop a vaccine. And it could take that long to not only develop, but create enough doses, if you will, of an effective treatment that everyone who needs it could get it. So I think we have to get used to a new normal. What do you think the new normal will look like for communities? That, that's a great question. Every Zoom call and conference call that I've been on in the last three months have been really trying to understand that. I think it's pretty clear that we are not going to be in as many densely packed environments in the near future. So when you think about a school classroom with 40 students, uh, that's, that's hard to imagine being safe. So school may look like fewer people in the classroom at any given time, more people doing some things online and virtually, and maybe longer school days uh, so that you can have a fewer people in the morning and then some people in the afternoon, um, but not everyone there at the same time. Some people are saying the work environment is going to be a combination of virtual uh, kinds of uh, work and in-person work for the foreseeable future. And again, work days that allow people to work different shifts so that they won't all be at work at the same time. When you look at riding the bus or riding um, public transportation. People are looking at ways to limit the number of people who are actually on the bus or in the train uh, at the same time. So I think that um, what we're gonna have to get used to is when we are out in, in the community, there are gonna be fewer people out there with us at any given time. But increasingly, we will be out in the community with other people because um, as the virus goes down, it'll be safer to do that. What do you think this new normal will look like for kids? I think kids are going to show us older people a lot of new ways to have fun, to socialize, to learn in in a world that necessarily involves both virtual and in person. Um, you know, I was reading uh, something the other day that people my age are learning how to use apps that people your age have been using a long time so that they could, so that they can play cards in the same, uh, using the, the same deck of, of cards virtually so that they can watch a movie together and not be in the same room and all of those kinds of things. So I think your generation 
is going to really teach all of us how to do this in a way that is fun and innovative. What can communities do to help people rebuild their lives? Well, I think the first thing that we can do is all get educated about what this virus does and why it's affected some communities more than others and really push for, advocate for changes that we know would make a difference in not having it spread the way it spread this time and devastated so many communities. So for example, we know that um, the virus spreads more when people are living in conditions where they can't separate from one another. And that has a lot to do with the kind of housing policies that we have in this country. And so getting educated about that and then advocating for changes. I think we've learned that um, the virus has done a lot of damage in places where people didn't have health insurance or the ability to get tested and pay for those tests. So, um, and we've also learned that it's really had a, a very dramatically negative effect on communities where uh, people had to go to work because they didn't have other alternatives. So I think one of the things that you and your generation will be able to do is to understand what those, we call them structural reasons uh, are, and then advocate for change. I think we, we can't expect that this is just going to get better or go away unless we work on the, the things that caused it to be so difficult already. My last question is, what can we learn from this coronavirus pandemic to prepare for future outbreaks? Mm. Well, um, when you think about why it got so bad so quickly, it was in part because we didn't have the people trained to combat it that we need to. And that's investment in public health. Um, you know, for a long time, people thought, well, these viruses and whatnot, they, they really don't cause that much trouble because as a, as a global community, we didn't have the experience. No one had really experienced a big epidemic or pandemic. And now we know what it feels like to have an infection that you can't really treat very well. And so I think that one of the things that that's going to mean is that we will hopefully shift the amount of resources, the amount of money that we spend on things like public health, things like um, vaccinations and simple things that we know really do make a difference in preventing this kind of a, of a pandemic in the future. Thank you so much for your time, doctor. Absolutely. It was nice to meet you. Good luck.